Now, firstly, what I wanted to do was just uh, ask you if you had any more questions from yesterday's evening's discussion, because it seemed to go on for a while there, the one about reincarnation. And if you wanted to uh, just ask any more questions about that, uh, we'll cover that first. Then there's a few little uh, things I'd like to talk about with regard to love and reflection of love in your life. And then we'll talk about anger. So that'll be the end of the informal discussions. And then we'll talk about forgiveness and mercy. So that's basically the plan for today. So let's get started firstly on the reincarnation stuff that you had questions for from yesterday that I terminated. So we can stop by there. Now Tristan has a mic and we definitely need to have your sound. And remember to hold it up nice and close. So stand in front of the edge. AJ, I have a question in regard to myself but also reincarnation about terminations. Um, when I've had a couple of pregnancy terminations and what actually happens, because I realise I haven't dealt with that emotionally at all. Right, yeah. I, one was very unconscious and one was more conscious and yeah. I don't quite understand what I need to do there. So, okay. And I really like to know what to do. Okay. Um, um, when, when the person incarnates, obviously you've got the, let's say this is the baby. So the baby now has, is the half of a soul. In this case, is a male half. You've got a spirit body created and a material body created. Right? That happens soon after conception. So from that moment on, and usually the woman will feel that, the, that there is a soul now connected to this creation inside of her. Many women feel that soul into them, in fact, uh, and, and connect to them. And so what happens now is that from that moment on, this little soul, which, by the way, has its own free will, needs to be respected. And the problem with uh, the abortions or terminations that occur is that most of the time we don't really understand what we're doing. We don't understand that actually we're terminating the life on earth of, a, of this little soul that's just been incarnated. Now what happens to the souls themselves when they pass is that there's a place in some, at the top of the first sphere called Summerland. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. Yep. Um, it's referred to in much spiritual literature and in this place, um, there are a large number of celestial spirits who, who take care of unborn children who have been terminated. So what actually happens when you terminate is the material body is disconnected from the spirit body. And from that moment on, now they're living in the spirit world as a, as a, as a little tiny child, if you like, that, that grows uh, naturally just as it would here on earth. And, and a celestial spirit um, nurses that child to maturity. When I say to maturity, the, the child has a choice of how large it's going to get and how old it's going to look. But that happens in some land. So in terms of what happens to the child, what happens to the child is that uh, you know, it's obviously looked after and cared for and loved. Now, that being said, there are a number of issues with regard to the termination that we need to face inside of us ourselves. And by the way, the responsibility for termination of pregnancy doesn't just rest with the woman. All right? The responsibility for termination of pregnancies rests with both the man and the woman who created this child. Does that make sense? So from a law of compensation point of view, or a karmic point of view, the person who terminated this, child, this child's the pregnancy will go through law of compensation emotions when you connect with what's actually happened. And really what's actually happened is you've taken away the free will of that child to have a choice to live here by its own choice and you've actually imposed your will on that child. And that is actually one of, the, and, and to be blunt with you, and I know this is going to sound very harsh for many women who have had terminations, but it, it's very similar to a murder from a point of view of a law of compensation point of view. And AJ, that child has emotions about that. The child has many emotions about that. The, the passing child actually has huge amounts of emotions that the nursing celestial spirit needs to help them get through. 
the, the huge emotions include emotions of not being wanted. So if you can imagine from the moment that you incarnated, you started feeling these feelings of not being wanted, and then when you were terminated, you know, nobody wanted you basically on earth. And, and so the child itself goes through quite large amounts of emotions, which the celestial spirit in some land nurses them through. Now, quite often what happens, because the mother is quite detuned from the act itself, so any of you who have had a termination will obviously go through two sets of differing types of emotions. Often what happens is many who have the termination go through very severe guilt type of emotions almost immediately. And that's the law of compensation emotions for actually the act that's just been done. Many uh, women, though, sort of detune from it completely and justify it using these intellectual justifications of I couldn't look after the child and so forth. And the problem with that is that uh, you're detuning from the law of compensation emotions, which you will need to experience at some other time. And you will also find from that moment onwards, you will start having a lot of problems with your internal uh, female organs as well, because there's chakra and energy points related to those emotions as well that will start shutting down. So you actually start harming your own body as well, detuning from those emotions. So, so what needs to really happen is for the woman who has terminated, now I'm not talking about miscarriages here, I'm talking about abortions. The, per the person who has aborted the child needs to face the fact that they've actually terminated the free will of another individual. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so if somebody asks me, am I pro-choice with regard to abortion? I am pro-choice with regard to your free will. What I mean by that is you're allowed to do anything you want. You're even allowed to break all of God's laws if that's what you want. But if you're asking me, am I breaking a law of God if I terminate a, a pregnancy? The answer is yes. And you will feel law of compensation emotions about that at some point in your life, either now or after you've passed. The key is not so much to go into judgment about what you've done. The key is to look very carefully at the causal emotions that created the event. Do you understand the difference between that? You see, what often we do is we, we go into judgment about what we... When we hear the truth, for instance, the, the truth that I'm saying to you about this situation is you have harmed the free will of another person when you terminate a pregnancy. Right? So that's the truth. Now, when we go into that truth, we then have a tendency to make the next step, which is to then judge ourselves for making that thing, and we go into this guilt phase. And to be honest with you, guilt doesn't really get you anywhere emotionally. It, uh, it goes, you go a lot often into self-punishment phase, and I'm not advocating that. What I'm advocating is, firstly, you realise what you've done, you prayed it and talked to God about forgiveness, gaining God's forgiveness and mercy about what you've done, but the step as repent, repentance step that's required, and remember we talked about repentance at the last one before Christmas, the repentance step that is required is that you need to actually look at the causal emotion inside of yourself that caused you to terminate that pregnancy. And you will find it was fear about your life being changed. It was fear about, you know, maybe your relationship wasn't working very well or it was a one-night stand and you don't want to be connected to that person. And, you know, there might be lots and lots of other things that have gone on that create that termination. And you need to work through those emotions. And by the way, it's not just the woman that needs to work through these emotions. The man needs to work through the emotions to the same intensity as the woman. You follow me? Because it was a creation of both parties. Now, if the male is, you know, a one night stand or something and you've never seen him again, then obviously then that makes it difficult for you to you know, to address that issue. He that, and of course it's his issue that he needs to face down the track at some point anyway. And he will actually go through law of compensation emotions about that. So if he actually enabled you to have the abortion, wanted you to have the abortion, used his influence to, on you to have your, the abortion, wouldn't support you if you didn't have the abortion, then he has a lot of law of compensation things to deal with in his own life as well about the abortion itself. Does that make sense? So from God's perspective, when we harm the free will of another, 
It's the free will is one of the greatest gifts that God has given you. So when you harm the free will of another person, it's one of the greatest sins, if you could call it that, or disharmonies with love, which remember I'm saying sin is disharmony with love. So it's the most great, one of the greatest disharmonies with love that you've done in your life when you've harmed the free will of another person, and particularly if you've harmed it permanently. Right? And when I say permanently, of course nothing is permanent, but in the sense of permanently on earth, this person now can't live their life on earth. And in fact, they can't live their life on earth again until they go right, right up to the soul union state with their soulmate and then return if they wanted to have a life on earth. Now at the moment there are some children who have, who have been terminated, who reached the soul union state in the 22nd sphere with their soulmate and they've chosen to reincarnate. <coughs> so since 1987 there has been other reincarnations <coughs> and many of those have been ones who never experienced a life on earth before. Does that make sense? And they wanted to experience it so they've reincarnated. So as you work through your emotion... And um, Tris, can I just... Yeah, it's important that we get this sound. Sorry, mate. So, really up close, yeah. yeah. So, as you work through your emotion, can you have a relationship with that terminated soul? Yeah, that's a good question. Look, look, let me explain what happens with this terminated soul and your relationship with it. When, when this child, let's, call it, let's say it's a female child, so let's say it's a little daughter. Let's say the daughter goes into summer land and for a year or two you were just totally detuned from what you've done as a mother. Well, during that time, the celestial spirit will never bring the child to you, even in the sleep state. And the reason why that's the case is because the child itself will be confronted with this person who didn't want them. And that's quite a damaging emotion to be confronted with constantly. And so what the celestial spirit does is nurture the child in an environment where it's wanted. Now, as soon as you start working through your guilt-based emotions and, your, and the, you know, what, what you've done in terms of uh, an abortion, what happens is you start feeling feelings for the child that you're aborted, generally. And sometimes you will start, and many times, you will start feeling feelings of love for the child. And now once that starts occurring, the celestial spirit will usually encourage that relationship. And allow that, you know, and allow that relationship to develop. So you'll um, you'll meet each other in the sleep state. You'll start meeting each other in the sleep state, and you'll start developing a relationship in the sleep state. And by the time you pass, you you know you'll be out, you'll meet them generally, and spend a lot of time with them probably. Yeah. And so forgiveness and everything, it will be forgiven. And yeah, the the child itself has no issue usually with forgiveness in the end. It's to do with the fact that you've broken God's laws. And what actually happens inside of you when you break God's laws is there's a penalty automatically on your soul. It's like throwing mud at yourself, if you like. So every time you break a law of God, nobody else but you gets mud thrown at you from you, if that makes sense. And so, so the, the impurities of your own soul are created by your own choices and actions. And so, obviously... Anything that you need to work through is based upon your own state, not on what they would think of you. But all of the children who are aborted, and there's, no, there's over 50 million of them every year, um, aborted. So all of those children are aborted, there's a lot. You can imagine in the spirit world how much work that creates. Uh, there's actually huge, huge locations in the spirit world where these children are looked after. And it creates a huge amount of work for people in the spirit world, which of course they love doing, uh, because it's all part of loving, loving each soul. Um, those children, as they grow, are not forced to follow the divine love path. They are actually offered, just like you are being offered, the path in conjunction with the natural love path. And many of them choose the natural love path rather than following the divine love path, and then some choose the divine love path. It just depends. Many of them do choose the divine love path, and in fact, the majority do choose or finish up choosing the divine love path because it enables them to remain children. 
And uh, whereas the natural love path usually encourages everyone to grow up and act your age, right? <laughs> uh, whereas the divine love path doesn't do that. So, so in the case of many children who die who are on the divine love path, many times when you see them, if they still have their spirit bodies, their spirit bodies will still be young, um, even though they may be highly developed. And when I say highly developed, in the celestial spheres above the eighth sphere, but they'll be highly developed. And they'll know far more than what you know here on Earth, um, and yet, and yet they look young. They may portray themselves as old when they communicate with you, because here on Earth we have a lot of stuff about age, don't we? Like, you know, if someone's younger than you, <coughs> excuse me, it makes it a lot harder to listen to them generally. <coughs> Sorry. And so. So if it makes it a lot harder to listen to them, generally what the spirit will do is they'll make themselves look older than what they really are so that you listen to them. And that's a common thing that happens when they portray an image to you of, of their own uh, you know, shape or size and, and, and their looks. Hey, AJ, what happens to the soul mate of the aborted spirit? Is it doomed to... And it's the same thing that would happen to the soul mate of any other person who passes, and that is nothing. Uh, when I say nothing, of course there is a soul link between the two halves of the soul, but in terms of death, death doesn't impact generally the other half of the soul unless it's conscious of the soul mate generally. And so, so the other half of the soul may live 80 years and then pass. But, but the problem is, is they never have the opportunity of meeting their soul mate on earth. Which is a sad thing as well. You see, when, when we abort a child, because we don't know the truth, we don't understand all of the impacts it's having on not just our own life, but the life of that child and the life of its soulmate and a lot of other things that are not considered. And, and so this is part of the law of compensation. When we, when we do damage to other souls, we're often not understanding what the impact is of, the, of those actions. And it's very important to understand the, the impact of all of the actions that we do. Yeah. Obviously, it's different if you know or you don't know. So if you don't know and you did it, that's a lot different than if you know about all of this and you did it. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's a higher culpability if you know compared to don't know. So that's... Um, can, the question was, why was that? I mean, it's still being done. It's still being done, but uh, one is a one is an active choice, whereas the other one is an ignorant choice, and um, and an active choices have have more penalties upon the soul la later in your life. So, for example, if you know that uh, you know doing something damaging, like for example, many of you would not know that each time you control your children to do your will, you're actually breaking their free will. So many of you wouldn't know that, right, until we've talked about that. Right? Now, there's a less of a penalty about that than there is if you know and deliberately do it, which is actually abusive. Do you follow me? So both are abusive, but, but one is less so because you don't know what's going on. It's probably the same thing was done to you, and, you know, it's a multi-generational thing. So God obviously attributes... Um, there, well, it's, and it's not God's attributes, it's actually the laws of God are such that if you do a deliberate act, that is different than doing an unconscious act. Okay? So, um, and there's different uh, sets of penalties that occur on the soul when you do those acts. However, I must point out that you may then argue in your own mind, well, it's best to remain ignorant. <laughs> and actually, one of the worst conditions in the spirit world are those who have chosen to remain ignorant. In fact, the, the areas in the spirit world in the first sphere, in the hills, are, they are literally populated by millions and millions of people who have never progressed for thousands of years in the spirit world because they chose to remain ignorant. So it's actually a very, very damaging state to choose to remain ignorant. So I just thought I'd clarify that for you. Just uh, wait for the mic. Okay. Thank you. Um, AJ, why would um, a child, um, when there's a possibility of being aborted, why would a child choose to come to their parents? 
Um, remember I said the process of incarnation when I did the introductory DVD? I haven't explained a lot of complexities about the process of incarnation. And to be honest with you, it's probably not best at this point to explain them all either because they're, very quite, they're quite scientific and mathematical anyway. But to understand that the process isn't just a process of attraction, it's also a, process, a mathematical process of incarnation. So God has created a process that's very, very similar in nature to a, com it's a combination of law of attraction events, scientific and mathematical processes that create the incarnation process of the soul. So whenever, whenever a male and a female on earth get together and have sexual relations, the creation of the, the child automatically attracts a soul. Right? Now that soul doesn't have a choice of the attraction because it's an, it's, a, it's an automatic process that God has created. That every single soul that yet to incarnate in the spirit world will have to go through this process of incarnation. Right? And so it is drawn to the creation of the child, the physical and spiritual bodies, and it attaches itself to that. Now, many times a person who aborts a child is not aware that they actually do have longings to have a child, but then the fears kick in once they find out that they are pregnant. Do you follow me? So, so many times a person will feel like, yes, I do want to have children, or I want to have children later on, or I feel this desire to have a child, and so forth. And many times these longings are present, and that causes, of course, the, the incarnation process to occur as well. So the law of attraction is a part of this scientific process that occurs that allows the incarnation of the child. So every single soul unincarnated in the spirit world must incarnate. And so they are always hovering about the earth plane, as the earth is often referred to, as a soul being drawn. It's like a, a sucking process, if you like, where the, where the half of the soul is connected to, this, to the bodies that have been created. Yeah, the soul, remember the soul at the point of incarnation, that the first incarnation is not self-aware. So therefore it doesn't understand its own free will yet. The whole process and the whole point of incarnation is to learn about free will. So, so if, you're, if you're aborting a child at the time or shortly after incarnation, you've actually interrupted that process of it learning about itself. And now it has to go through this, a, a different process now in the spirit world that would normally be the case that it would have on earth. And, and it is a hard thing for that child to go through those things. And I have talked to some who have gone through it as a miscarriage. And we'll talk about miscarriages as well, perhaps, as part of this discussion. But it's, uh, a miscarriage is, often, often, is obviously different from the parent's point of view than, a, than an abortion, because one act is deliberate, whereas the other is unintentional. Both are very much emotional, but one is deliberate, one is unintentional. Matt, sorry? Um, at the point of the first incarnation, um, the soul divides into two. That's right. Um, can they be born at different times? They will be born at different times. Uh, I, mean, the time. I mean, in different years. In maybe. different years, yeah. Uh, and they could be born 20 or even 30 years apart. Yeah. Usually, what happens after the first incarnation of the first half of the soul? The second half of the soul will hover, hover around due to the law of attraction of the two halves, waiting for incarnation opportunity, usually wherever the first one is at the time that it gets an opportunity to incarnate. So, and this is usual, but not always the case, by the way. But what will happen is that, uh, for, for example, if you were born here in Australia, and you never left Australia, and you were the first half of the soul that incarnated, there's a high likelihood that your soulmate was born in Australia. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But if you were born, let's say you were born in Australia, but your parents then went to Italy and they stayed there for three years, right? And then they came home to Australia, then there's a whole possibility that your soulmate was born in Italy or Australia. All right? So, but the two halves of the soul, remember, will always be attracted to each other over time. And the way God made it is that even if your soulmate's born on the opposite side of the world, at some point you'll be drawn together. Right? Now, that can happen here on earth depending on your emotional condition. 
Um, if you don't work through your emotions about men or women, the opposite gender generally, then, um, and, or if you're a gay soul and you don't work through both gender emotions, generally you will not attract your soulmate. But if you start working through emotions and allow yourself to work in your passions, then what will happen is that you will attract your soulmate. No matter what happens to them. If he's still alive. Uh, no, even in the spirit world, if your soulmate has passed, you will attract them as you're working through your emotions. Yeah. Can your soulmate be your brother or sister? Not, gen no, not generally. But at the beginning of human, uh, you know, birthing and so forth, back in the time of Ammon and the man, that was the case. Uh, just a way for the mic. Back up. It's good if we can get this mic thing happening. I'm sorry. Hi, Jay. Um, is it guaranteed or highly likely that when you meet your soulmate that you'll know it's your soulmate? No. In fact, it's highly likely that you won't know. <laughs> so... Um, now, can I clarify that? Yeah. The majority of you um, probably have already met your soulmates. Now, some of you will have a knowing that you think that might be such and such a person. Right? But um, many times our injuries prevent us from recognising the fact. So you could actually be walking down the street, walk straight past your soulmate, and if you've got some opposite gender injuries, let's say you're a female and a soulmate's male, you've got some opposite gender injuries, Right? If you've got anger with men, but he hasn't got any feelings that he will put up with anger from women, you'll walk straight past him and not even feel attracted. But if you've worked through your anger with men, and he doesn't have any feelings that men can, women can treat him badly, and you put up with it, then it's likely you'll be more attracted. Can you see how your emotional injuries will impact upon the process of meeting your soulmate? That being said, you can develop yourself to the point where you've worked through all of your gender-based or many of your gender-based injuries and it's highly likely then that when you meet your soulmate you'll recognise them whether they recognise you or not. Mm. There's a lot I want to say about soulmates in a complete discussion because it, it's, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's something that we have a tendency to romanticise um, <laughs> and it is a romantic relationship but we have a tendency to romanticise it. And the problem with that is that we romanticise the actual development of the relationship as well. We think that a soulmate relationship will be a relationship without any troubles and without any trauma, and actually the opposite is normally the case. And the reason why is because you actually often got opposite soul-based injuries, and if you have, then obviously you're going to have issues working with, between each other. So if you have an attraction for someone over, say, 20 years, mm -hmm. could that be an indication that they're your soulmate? It could be an indication that they're your soulmate, but it could also be an indication that you haven't dealt with an emotion about the opposite gender for 20 years. Louise, might as well do it. I would like to ask about free will. Um, where did the first thought or um, idea come about murder or, or stealing or that we can rape or abort a child or any of these things if we work this thing? Yep, good question. Um, free will, of course, means that you are allowed to have any thought you wish and you are also allowed to develop any desire you wish and you are allowed to have any passion you wish. Now, if you can think about it from a point of view of a pristine soul, and remember I said to you right in the beginning that the first human couple's biggest mistake, and only, in fact, mistake that they made, was this desire to be God rather than to become God-reliant. In the process of this desire to be God, they detuned or di they disconnected from God. They committed what you would say was the greatest sin. I talked about this in the first century a lot, called the sin of the Holy Spirit. You've heard of that? And what that is, is a denial of God's love. So God's love being offered to you, and because, for whatever reason, you decide to not accept it. Now, remember the first human couple were in a state of perfection. 
being in a state of perfection, they didn't have any emotional injuries determining whether they accepted God's love or not. All they had was their free will. They were allowed to accept it or they were allowed to reject it. And what happened is they allowed a desire within themselves to develop. The desire to be like God, but to be like God without God. And that desire developed more and more and more until it, and like every desire that develops out of harmony with love, it gives birth to what I would call sin or disharmony with love, actions that are disharmonious with love. And so they made the choice, a free will choice, to step away from God. Now in that free will choice, they created a fragmentation between themselves and God. So, inside of their soul, and this is, there's another factor in amongst all of this. Remember the soul at the point of this stage, when, before incarnation, is pristine. When it incarnates, in the first human couple case, it incarnated in a pristine state. Right? So we've got the male and female split, and you've got the two bodies attached to each part of the soul. The two bodies being the spirit body and the material body. Now what happens is that this soul, God has put in instinctually one particular thing that is a huge thing in fact. And that is the instinct of love. The instinct of natural love is what he placed inside of each of you. Now whenever you break a natural love principle, there is a knowing inside of the soul that that is actually occurring while you're doing it. But most often what we try to do is detune from it, detune from the fact that we're doing it. In other words, we go along, do something, but we're detuned from the fact that we've just harmed our own soul. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And because we detune from harm to our own soul, we also make the next step, which is detuning from the harm of when we harm other souls. Can you see? Yep. Now once you start getting into that state where you've detuned from your own soul, truth through choice, and you've detuned from the harm towards other souls, whether it's you doing it or other people doing it, that, that gives birth to many, many very, dis you know, very destroying things when it comes to life here on earth. And that's what's given birth from thereafter to the most of the so-called sin that we see or the disharmony with love that we see on the earth today. And what we need to do is make the choice to undo that process. The choice is inside of you to undo that process. Nobody else can undo that process for you. So there is no, you know, like sacrifice that I've done for you that will help you undo that. Right? You need to undo that within yourself. What I'm telling you, though, is that you have two ways of undoing that. One way is to follow the natural love path, which is developing yourself in natural love. And one way is to develop yourself in a combination of natural love and divine love. That's the other way. The divine love way is faster than the natural love way. The divine love way is infinite, whereas the natural love way stops at the sixth year, or stops when you become perfect again. In other words, without those emotional damages that have created you to do the acts that you might have done or chosen to do here on earth. So can I just finish that then? So can you see how once this soul begins an act of violence towards itself, because that's really what every act is. Every act in disharmony with love is an act of violence towards yourself initially, but also towards others. But every act of harmony, disharmony is an act of violence towards yourself. That your soul has a consciousness of what it should be doing as well. What you would say is its instinct with regard to natural love. And what happens is the differential between the instinctual consciousness and what you actually do creates the law of compensation. In other words, when you become conscious of this instinctual consciousness that you have, and you become conscious of what you've done, you will see a great disharmony between the two things. And you will feel shamed of yourself and guilty about it and all of those kind of things. That's what creates the law of compensation. It's all happening inside of yourself. And this is the beauty of what God's created. God's created all this happening inside of you. 
There needs to be no, there doesn't need to be any other person in existence in the universe, and you will still feel these things. Uh, and that's the beauty of the system God has created. It is self-maintaining. It maintains itself. God doesn't have to go, oh yeah, I saw him do that this week, and I saw her do that this week, no, no. You know, just like we tell our children, Father Christmas does, right? <laughs> God doesn't do that, because God doesn't have to. God created a system that's perfectly flawless. And, and our soul, its choices, depend on how it works with us. So it's all about your choices. So that's a very important thing to ponder upon and meditate upon if you want to develop your life spiritually. AJ, I, don't, I uh, can't understand, yeah. if you possibly hear me, yeah. um, if God is a God of love and perfect love, and God created um, the two first beings, mm -hmm. they had no parents who gave them any flaws that they had. Spot on. God created a perfect world. Spot on. How could they possibly have something within them that conflicted with God's perfect love? Um, this is a major mistake that most people make with regard to the, the free will choices. The truth is that your choice to be at one with God is not based upon your emotional injuries. So I'll say that again. But so if God so created good. them... He would have created perfect beings. But what's your definition of perfect? Like God. Yeah, see, see uh, this, God's is, image. this is the major mistake that most people make with regard to the incarnation of the soul. Here's the soul. We said the soul incarnates. The soul was created in the image of God, but it only has natural love instinctively in it. It does not have divine love at that point. It has the opportunity to choose to receive divine love. In other words, it has the opportunity to choose to enter a personal relationship with God. Right? It has natural love as an instinctual quality built in. Every single soul has that. So what, we, what you're assuming is that perfection in natural love is the same as perfection in divine love. And that's not the case. The only perfect being in the universe is God, the self. Right? If, we, if, if you think of God as infinitely perfect, then where are we? We are always working towards more perfection, are we not? Can you see that? So how can we ever say that we are perfect? We can't, can we? Because we're progressing towards this infinite perfection that God is. And so there's, we often make this mistake in then believing that we're infinitely perfect, which of course we can't be unless we progress in divine love, and that is a choice. Right? So the truth is that actually the natural love was in this soul, and when they incarnated Amon and Amen, the first human couple, the female I am and the male I am, when they first incarnated, they were perfect in their display of natural love. But they still had free will. They could still choose to do whatever they desired and whatever they wished. And when you talk to the both of them, you will, and many of you will have an opportunity at some point in your lives to talk to Hamon and Amen, you will, you will, you will start he hearing from them what emotions in them began to be developed. And, and this is something most people don't understand about, it, about desire. Desire grows. Desire is fed by you. Like, so you know how you can meet somebody and not feel any for, anything for them at all, right? And then the next week you can meet them again and actually have a bit of a feeling for them, can't you? And then a week later you feel a bit stronger for them. And maybe a few weeks later you're even starting to feel quite romantic about the person, right? Maybe. Even though right at the beginning you didn't have that. Now how did that happen? It happened by you nurturing your desire. And it grew. Now, this is the same as your relationship with God. This is how you grow in your relationship with God. You need to nurture your desire. Now, what, what Ammon and Amman did was they nurtured their desire in the opposite direction. They wanted to become gods. And they decided they didn't want to nurture their desire towards God. They wanted to nurture their desire towards developing themselves 
and take, you know, being responsible completely for themselves without their connection to God. So they chose to walk away from God through nurturing that desire. So the desire began, and there's a very good simile in the Bible, you know, in the Genesis, in the book of Genesis, it actually says that, you know, they, that Eve saw the apple, right? <laughs> is the analogy. The apple being the object of her desire. But the reality is, both Ammon and Amman saw the apple, and if we could use the term apple, the apple was their object of desire, and they grew in their desire for that object to such a point, and the object, by the way, was to be gods themselves. And they grew in that desire to such a point that they walked away from God and from God's truth. They regretted it, um, even while they were on earth. Um, but they didn't know how to walk back after that point. And they only found out after, well, after I'd become at one with God how to walk back towards God. Yeah. Just back to the Can I just stop you there for a minute? Because there's something else I want to say about that question. Those questions about God, by the way, are born from a feeling inside of you. The feeling inside of you is that, that God is unjust in some way, that God is punishing in some way, that God, you know, that there's a lot of those feelings that, that create these questions. The key is to look back inside of yourself and ask yourself, why am I asking these questions? It's great to ask them, by the way. But ask yourself why you're asking them, because many times what's happening is an emotion inside of you that's creating or generating this question, and it's an emotion that we need to at some point connect to. Does that make sense? And that applies to every question you're asking. Far away. Yeah, just, sorry, I just wanted to complete about the two emotions. Mm -hmm. okay. I've got a determination, and I felt quite unwanted as a child. Mm -hmm. that, that was part of the reason why I actually... I, I had the termination. Like, as you spoke, I'm aware that I did teach myself. I believed in reincarnation and I had counseling and thought, well, this is the best action for me to take. Mm -hmm. And um, also, like, the process of compensation, would you just give us some steps about how to do that? Is it like feeling the unwantedness and remorse and um, sure. those Yeah, so the first half of your question was. Um, about the termination itself. And uh, you can see, firstly, as just as a comment, how, how um, reincarnation can cause you to do something that you may otherwise not do if you knew the truth, um, and particularly the truth of the laws of free will. So let's say, yes, so let's say that's what happened. I had a termination. The termination, you are right, in your case, was all about you feel children generally are unwanted. Um, you feel unwanted, and of course that sets up a cycle inside of yourself. That therefore, when you about you know when you're pregnant, you then feel like, is this child going to love this world? No, this child's going to be you know we have a lot of things go on inside of us, starting to actually justify terminating the child. Now, in terms of what happens with the law of compensation with it, is here's your soul. So here's your half of your soul. By the way. We've also got to consider the male half of the soul as well in this process. Bear in mind, you notice that I'm always referring to the fact that there's equal culpability here if the decision was mutual. If the decision wasn't mutual, if like the man wanted to keep the baby and you didn't want to, then obviously it's a far less mutual decision. Does that make sense? But if the decision is mutual, then obviously there's an equal law of compensation applied to the, the, the male part who was created this child. So remember, so there's the male and the female as a soul perspective, as God sees you. He is the little baby that says it's a female child, as God sees it. Now, what happens is that determination of this one's free will creates a penalty inside of those parents. Now that penalty will need to be experienced. It can only be experienced in one of two ways. One way is that every time you will you will at some point in your life 
have to think completely about what you've done and come to terms completely about how much it affected this person's life and how much it even affected the life of its soulmate as well. You will actually go through these feelings inside of yourself. Now those feelings are the result of the difference between you breaking the law and the natural love law that was already inside of your soul and you feel the difference between those two states. So what happens then is that you go through this process of what you would call compensation. In other words, now this is assuming you're not involving God in the process, right? This is assuming this is just you and you're understanding the truth. You go through a process of compensation and what that means is you feel guilt, you feel shame, you cry, you feel terrible inside of yourself for what you've done. Just like you would as if you had murdered the person and came to acknowledgement that you've done that. Does that make sense? Now, if you involve God in the process, if you allow these tears and, and, and direct them towards God and have a feeling of repentance and focus on what caused you to make the decision to abort the child, and both the husband and the wife, or you know, the male and the female, need to do this, what you will do then is you'll develop the relationship with God further and God's love can come and take away the cause that's inside of your soul and then you don't have to experience the compensation. And then some people would say, uh, but if I do that then I can have another abortion and if I do that again then it's all you know, fine. But of course it doesn't work that way. Right? Because obviously every sincere act God knows inside of you, and every insincere act, God also knows. And there are different laws that are, that are, that judge each act, if you like. So when I say judge the act, there are different compensation effects or penalties upon the soul as a result of the laws that you break, and the choices that you made to break them. So if you presume on God's mercy, you will find that your presumption will not be rewarded. Do you understand what I mean by that? Imagine for a moment, uh, and there's an illustration, there's many illustrations that I gave in the first century about presumption of mercy. One of them I asked you to read today for the section on mercy. If you read it, the one that I sent out, did everyone get to read that? Yes. Who hates the Bible? Right. In, there, in the one I sent out, there was this uh, illustration of a man who had a debt, a huge debt, in fact it was billions and billions of dollars to his owner, his, who, who, he was a slave. And he owed this debt to the slave, and, he, and, and the owner was going to put the slave and all of his family in jail right, as a result. Now, he went and pleaded repentance to the owner, to the landholder, and the owner decided to absolve him because of the plea of repentance affected the owner's heart. The owner decided to absolve him of all of the debt. But then that same man who had a debt had a man who owed him money. And instead of absolving that person of his debt, you know what he did? He went and went to strangle him when he couldn't pay the money. Now, what had that man not learned? He had not learned the lesson of mercy, had he? No. He hadn't learned a lesson of love. And that is, that we can't fake repentance. And you can't fake repentance with God. So when it comes to this issue of the law of compensation with regard to anything we have done, not just the abortion of a child, but anything that we have done, we cannot fake repentance with God. It has to be real and felt inside of yourself. And that's what appeals to God's heart. And in the the appealing it to God's heart automatically draws the, forgive, uh, the, the process of mercy from God, which actually is divine love entering you and helping remove from you the reason why you did the act you did. So if you are truly repentant or truly sorry for the act, you would want to actually work through the reason why you did it. Now this, of course, applies to all sorts of things, including relationships, right, with people, doesn't it? Let's say you're in a husband and wife relationship, right, and the man goes out and cheats on the wife. How do you stay together after that? There's a lot of broken trust, there's a lot of broken feelings, there's a lot of 
you know, the love is, has really been harmed a lot between the two of you, perhaps. What you would need to do is actually the man would need to go through a process of repentance, wouldn't he, at some point, of being sorry for what he's done. Now, it's one thing just to say sorry, but quite a lot, a lot different to work on the reason why you did it in the first place. Because, you see, if the man doesn't work on the reason why he did it in the first place, what's highly likely? Do it again. He'll just do it again. And so, can you see why God is always trying to focus you on the reasons or the causes within you as to why you do things, rather than the effects? So, rather than trying here to do things right, God wants it to be motivated as a desire from here to do things right. So, most religious practices on earth today get you here, don't they? Right? So, they make you feel guilty about doing something wrong. So, let's say you, you were a Christian at some point, and you went along to church, and many of you probably still do, right? And many times you'll hear, you know, if you do this, you will be punished. <coughs> and so, what happens inside of here is, we have this thought, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. And then when we meet someone we're attracted to, we're with a partner and we meet someone else we're attracted to, the thought ticks in, I can't do that. And so we walk away. Right? But the feeling still is, I'm attracted to them. I'm attracted to them. <coughs> right? And I need to deal with what God feels, is you need to deal with the emotion in that. Why are you attracted to them? Work out what's going on. Does that make sense? That's what. That's why I always refer to the heart as being the seat of motivation, not your head. So it's the soul that needs to change. So in this aspect with regard to abortion, it's exactly the same. It's the soul that needs to change. So therefore it's an emotion that needs to be experienced, that needs to be released, so that you don't have the feeling of doing that again, and that you can't agree with it, anybody doing that again. Does that make sense? Thanks, Tristan. Um, AJ, bringing things to, back to reincarnation, uh, I guess I said that people think you can only reincarnate from the 22nd sphere. Um, and, and other times I've heard uh, talk about 14. Yep. Um, what can you tell us about that? So the first was in 1962. Um, who since then? What's, what's the why now? What's, you know? From 1962 to 1987, um, the first seven sold uh, reincarnations occurred, which split into 14 halves. From then, there has been other reincarnations occurring, because obviously it's based around their free will. They're allowed to choose to reincarnate or not. The object of the first seven who reincarnated, though, was different. The object of the first seven was to actually come to teach uh, the truths that they've experienced on Earth again. And so, and to correct many of the misunderstandings and so forth that are on Earth about, you know, what the truths are meant to be, sort of thing. There were, there's a lot involved in God's plan in this. So once you get to the state of the 22nd sphere, you could, li you could liken yourself to being a person who has... This, this really, really strong, direct connection with God. You, you, talk, you speak to God and hear God and so forth directly as a complete soul unit. You will do that before then as a half of the soul, but it's a totally different experience doing it as a complete soul. And once you're in that state, you also can see what God's plans are. God tells you her plans um, as if you were hearing them, right? Uh, as if you would be hearing me speak. And so there was a combination of God's plans and what our desires were mixed together that created our desire to reincarnate. Now, we knew about it in the 40s. <laughs> There's a spirit actually influencing him. <laughs> yeah, he's got something to say. Um, so when, the, when, the, um, when, re when we knew that reincarnation was a definite, was a definite thing that could occur, and we, we still made, made the progression into the soul spheres, into the 22nd sphere, into that soul union state. Once we're in the soul union state, um, we helped other souls, so myself, 
and Mary was the first, were the first soul into that soul in the state. And then we helped other people get to that state as well over a period of time. And so we stayed in that state for an earth time, which is totally different to what's there, of course, uh, for a period of time, 20 or so years. And then once we knew that the others would find their way to the soul union state for certain, then there was a choice of me reincarnating first. So, so that was the process that occurred. And in terms of the choice, the choice was based around my own love for people on earth and, and in the spirit world. And, and when I say my own, I mean our soul, both Mary and myself together as one soul, our own, our own choice. And then um, once that choice was made, um, then and we also had, you know, new God's plan, if you like, uh, in that state, uh, new God's plan as to what God wanted to accomplish. So, and it all occurred in a way where the earth was also ready. There were many other times where that we'd communicated with people on earth before then, and where we felt that that would be all we could do, but. Um, we didn't understand God's own plan at that point. See, see, God's plan is something you discover, just like everything else. So, so it just depends on your desire to discover as to what you discover. And so, once you get to the 22nd sphere, you find a lot about, about <laughs> God's plans generally and universally, um, and, and can put m many more things than you can put here into action very powerfully unless you're in this soul union state, which you can be here on Earth as well. And we wanted to demonstrate the fact that you can be in the soul union state here on Earth and how powerful a state that is in the physical as well. So at some point in the future, that will be demonstrated. So there's a lot of goals and plans, if you like, that God has as a part of this reincarnation process, um, which will come to pass and which will come to be known by you and many others in time. And the key... The key is to understand that obviously it's a lot more than just the physics that I've actually dis described. Yeah. And so are the others teaching as well? No, or each one of them. They, there's some that are. Um, like some of you have met Cornelius, yes? Mm -hmm. So you can see that he's still got emotions to work through from the first century in particular, like all of us have. And he's, But he's also began doing some teaching as well. Others have taught on and off, but at this point, many of them are still going through some really hard emotions with regard to identity. So the majority of the 14 have some really big struggles about personal identity. And the fragmentation of an identity of being a person growing up in this body, which is totally different from the body that I had for nearly 2,000 years. And it's, there are some pretty large psychological, if you like, impacts of that, which many of them are still working through emotionally. So the majority of them are not teaching, and some of them are not even conscious of who they are. In fact, there's a couple who are. There are some who are conscious of who they are, but are, rigid, re, are totally desirous of not working through any emotion whatsoever at this point, because they know that when they begin the process that they won't be able to stop it. And they also know that it's going to be quite a traumatic process, and so many of the one, many of those are not, not doing that. And then some of the others of the 14 have done it for a period of time until they got together with their soulmate. And then, because their desire for God still hasn't been developed fully, in, again, because of their injuries with God, some anger with God uh, that they feel because of the reincarnation process and so forth, and they have not chosen to continue developing their relationship with God. They will in time, but at the moment they're not. So every one of the 14 is in a different condition. And, uh, and I'm trying to help everyone of the 14 as best, as best I can. But obviously it's very dependent upon their free will. But in time, more and more, and obviously when I become a one again, there will be a very strong soul connection <coughs> uh, with me in that condition, because that's the condition that remembered me in for most of my life. And so that will cause a lot of attractions to change as well. Any other questions? Back there, Can I go back to Adam and Eve? Mm -hmm. And you talked about how they wanted to be <coughs> gods. When did this occur? If they were the only two and then they had kids, who did they want to be gods over? Um, there's a common misconception that when we talk about the term god, that it means you want to lord it over something. <coughs> Um, the truth is that 
being being God, that what they wanted is the was the freedom to create their own laws and the freedom to create. Does that make sense? Like, in other words, the freedom to create their own universes and their own laws in disharmony with God. They had a very complex and very uh, uh, bright intellect, much brighter than any person here on earth today has. And at the moment, many of you would all know that we use probably at the most 10%, and in fact, recent studies have shown that we're probably only using more like 3 or 4% of their brain, for example. Whereas back then, they were using 100% of their brain intellectually. So if you can imagine what kind of concepts you could dream up in that state, um, with your own intellect fully, fully burned and brightly, um, they came up with some really complicated things that they would have liked to have achieved. And some of those things that they would have liked to have achieved were things like creating their own universe with their own laws, in total disregard to any of God's laws. And so... Um